Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Um, today I wanted to discuss uh, something that obviously I've discussed before, and that's bariatric surgery. Um, as some of you who've watched my videos know, I went for a procedure on the 8th of December 2018. It didn't, when I went to hospital, I went in believing I was going to get like a lap band or a gastric sleeve and on the table I pretty much got told we can't do either one of those because you have severe reflux so the only one we can do which is one that I should never have been able to get was the gastric bypass. Now I wasn't big enough to get that but that's money pay, money talks and the surgeon did that for me. Now, what followed was four and a half months of being unable to eat anything a week after my procedure. I had a collapsed um, with severe chest pain and I collapsed at the shops doing some Christmas shopping, card shopping for the kids for school and um, had some really severe chest pain, couldn't quite breathe properly. Um, got taken back to the original private hospital which I wish I hadn't been it cost an extra 12 an extra fourteen thousand dollars on the initial ten thousand dollars out of pocket just because each scan they did and each test they did was seven hundred dollars and above which is absolutely ridiculous when it's a follow-up when it's a complication from a surgery I don't believe that it should cost you any extra because it's their screw up. So what ended up happening was they, they found a blood clot in my lung. So I had to go on blood thinners and all this stuff. Then I started having severe stomach spasms and esophageal spasms, which the best way I can explain is as women, when you've had a baby, you know, labor pains. Well, it's like you're going into labor, like you're about to give birth from here from your chest it is intense and there is no medication in this world that could take that pain away i got given um heart medication and joint medication to spray under my tongue that took it away for like two seconds and they're like oh you can just keep having this tablet under your tongue every five minutes um which gets expensive um so basically for the following four and a half months i could not eat anything and i mean nothing i tried having um pureed fruits so i even went so far as having baby pureed food and it was just um, my body couldn't handle it couldn't tolerate it then it followed on with two and a half months of being unable to go to the bathroom so i went to see the specialist who i got referred to after the doctor ditched me because uh, it was a complicated case and um, of course this one charged, but thank goodness he, out of the kindness of his heart, thought, you know, this woman's been through enough trauma that I don't need to charge her on top of what she's already paid. He took a look at me and said, you are not, um, after two and a half months, basically four and a half months, I suffer from severe back pain. My, I've got T4 syndrome, I've got, Heterotopic suffocation of the spine, extremely rare. That's another story. I've got um, on my hips, I've got my something stenosis where my ligaments, my joints and tendons are turning into bone as well. So um, basically I'm the woman who's turning into bone. <laughs> A nice way to say it. Um, and... I lost my train of thought. So yeah, after not being able to go to the bathroom, my GP at the time, who I'd been seeing since 2013, because I was terrified of being accused of doctor shopping and all that sort of stuff, which happens a lot in Australia. There's a lot of people who gave, you give genuine people in need a bad rep because they have an addiction to opiates and they will go to any doctor and a bunch of doctors to get the medication then sell it and it's 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 ridiculous anyway um i went to the doctor he took one look at me and said you are not digesting any of your medications i'm referring you to 
the top gastric surgeon in Australia, which happened to be Dr. George Hopkins. He was in the episode, the, um, the guy who ate himself to death from 600 pounds plus. Um, and he's my doctor, so uh, very blessed. He took x-rays off my stomach and they found that basically from top to bottom, my, uh, what do you call it, my bowel, my everything was pills. All the pills I'd been taking that I'd been hurting to swallow were all in my digestive system. So if even one of them had started digesting, it would have set off a train event and I would have died from an overdose. And um, so I was rushed to hospital. I was given like eight litres of water just so they could cannulate me. It was ridiculous. I had four large enemas. I think I believe it was two small ones. And all that just trying to get rid of the tablets. And it was unbelievable. You literally looked at the toilet bowl and it was undigested. Like I'd just taken them pills. And I thank the Lord every day that it, nothing digested because I wasn't eating anything. It, it was just backed up. and um, But I was going septic. So I had a bunch of tests, got hydrated. I'm on a ton of, I'm on tablet potassium, tablet um, magnesium, multivitamins, which I have to take for the rest of my life. The one thing they don't tell you, and I think it's important to get this message across, is that one in three of the gastric bypasses go completely bad. Mine went bad. Um, you know, Diane from the BGA family, honey, I'm so sorry you lost your mum. You know, I know what it feels like to be in that position where I pretty much was a death door and there was nothing I could do about it. I was so sick and all my GP could say was, oh, well, you're still fat enough that you can starve yourself for a bit longer and it won't do your body any harm. Never mind that, hey, look, you know, maybe I'll do some blood tests and see what's going on. If he'd managed to do some blood tests, he would have seen that my potassium levels were like two to one and something. So I was literally a walking heart attack. Even now, my potassium on the tablets, I've just had a test, I'm waiting for the results. If it drops below four, I have to go back into hospital and be infused with potassium um, because I'm in the danger zone. And um, a lot of people look and say, wow, you were 265 pounds, you're, now you're like 120 pounds. That's incredible. Yes, that is incredible if it had been done right. But the fact that I still, to this day, is it's like, to me, it's like being pregnant. When I was pregnant, the first three months of my pregnancy and for the nine months, uh, I had, for the 36 weeks that I carried both my kids, I had severe hyperemesis, which is uh, the Duchess of Cambridge. It's um, like severe morning sickness that you have all day and all night. You just get so dehydrated that you're often hospitalised and get reef get fluids put back into you so you can, because you're just sick all the time. And the only time it stops is the day you give birth. So, um, yeah, it's a problem I've had. I've been accused of being a junkie because I've been cannulated that many times that my veins have disappeared. I used to have really pop out veins, but now my veins are all scarred. This, I've got one vein that's still kind of good, um, but even doing it through sit, um, ultrasound guided ones, they still miss, they get arteries. And if you've ever, ever had a cannula in your artery, it's kind of funny, but it's freaky as well because they take the bandage off and it's like, pss, 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 it's spurting blood. And when you're having potassium put straight into your um, artery, oh my God, like having it in your vein is bad enough, but having it in your artery, it's another tub of pain. It's like, the best way I could explain it, having potassium is like having acid, battery acid, which I've had in my eye, 
it hurts like a bitch. It's like having battery acid put directly into your veins. That stuff burns and it stings and you put hot um hot pack on it and it's like kind of takes the pain away but then my body's gotten to the point where they even put a little bit on me my whole arm i can't move it it's paralyzed um and it can only tolerate very little so i'm on very strong 600 ml tablets and uh, it takes me an hour and a half to swallow four tablets two magnesium and two potassium that's because they make me want to vomit i still have the gag reflex my esophagus still spasms but for the last uh oh, let's say when was it let's see i just spent was in hospital for a week was able to eat for one and a half days then got severe gastro uh, for the following week, I was extremely sick, going to the bathroom, running to the bathroom, if you get what I mean. Uh, losing count after 19 times. Like, it, I was going that much that I was passing blood and everything. Um, got put back into hospital, got fluids, got vitamins, got everything infused. Uh, then was able to eat two whip uh, which is an Australian thing. Um... And with some um, uh, lactose-free milk and felt re-energized. Uh, came home, I've been trying to have hard-boiled eggs. I've got to out my protein because um, my body's severely lacking protein. So I've been buying, I've, I bought a Thermomix, which I've been trying to cook pea and ham soup um, with extra hock ham hock but cannot find hocks anywhere right now my our butcher keeps saying it was going to be available yesterday then he says it's going to be available tomorrow gosh god knows when it'll be available so for now i have to just play the patience game my husband's gone to buy um some pasta and some ribs with barbecue sauce not like you guys get in america it's not even comparable it's like i miss american food Especially Taco Bell. My God, Australians, you suck. I love Australia, but you suck at the Mexican food. Gomez y Gomez, you're probably the closest, and now I can't even eat you. So, um, you know, so trying to learn to eat again is a big process of this procedure where, you know, there's women that I've heard of that have not eaten anything solid for four years other woman I've heard of, seven years she hasn't eaten anything solid. All she's had been able to have is broths because her body can't handle it. I was watching Big Appetite, shout out to you, Big Appetite, uh, last night. And he was e eating um, sashimi, salmon sashimi. And I thought, my God, that looks so buttery and yummy. Uh, $84 later, I ordered... Um, some sushi, some cooked chicken for the kids, which they refuse to try. Um, my heart and seared salmon, um, prawn, nigiri, um, avocado, and all this stuff. Um, tuna. My kids weren't having it when they were babies. They would gobble that stuff down like the tuna, sushi. Like there was no tomorrow. Now they look at it and go, ugh. Um, which amazes me. Anyways, I managed to have four of the, about this big, of rice and a little slice of salmon. So I had four of those, which was huge for me. That's a huge, huge meal. A lot of people would go, gosh, I could eat like 12 of them and I'd still be hungry. Well, four of those and I was that exhausted. I came to bed, I fell asleep did not wake up till like 9.30 this morning or 8.30 this morning. Got up, got ready to go to my doctor's my appointment uh, for my mental health. I'm doing a DBT course and I couldn't stop vomiting. Um, I had a couple of bits of sushi, a cooked prawn tempura one, and I just couldn't stomach it. I couldn't stop vomiting, so I had to ring my counsellor and said I'm really sorry at the time it felt like I had 
um, fluid in my lungs. I was like, <gasps> with the, the raspy, liquidy sound. So I took my asthma puffer and lay on my side at recovery position. It was coughing, vomiting, coughing, vomiting. And um, nearly, was nearly going to call the ambulance because my breathing was just, I felt like I had fluid in my lungs. And thank goodness it got better after I took my asthma medication. But it annoys me because I'm very much, I want to be to my appointments and I want to be on time. If not early yesterday, I missed an appointment. Um, running late because my daughter was running late. They, my kids don't like to get ready. So if you're a parent, you know what it's like. It's hell trying to get your kids ready to go to school or it's holidays at the moment. So I had to drop a daughter to daycare. And she took about an hour to get ready. I had to be at my appointment by quarter to ten in the morning. Didn't get there till quarter past ten. So they cancelled my procedure, which was to get uh, needles straight into my spine. Um, specially guided needles put into my spine because the arthritis, um, my arthritic joint... Um, on my spine's really stuffed, basically, and uh, I've got arthritis above where the last surgery, the, my L3 bones, um, so it's all crunching up and they need to put fluid in there to try and, I don't know, help um, so I can manage. Right now what's happening is I'm losing feeling in my legs. My left leg is like a heavy weight to try and drag around when I put weight on it. It, this pain goes up my spine that gives you goosebumps and you if you're looking at me <laughs> one minute I look color, I've got color the next minute I've taken a step and there's no color in me followed by shaking and then boom I pass out and go into severe back spasms and end up in hospital and it's just it's a merry-go-round it's 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 not nuisance so today I've stayed in bed I've taken my opiates only twice because I just, I hate taking medication. I know for a long time people were like, oh, you know, you're just hooked on medications. I said, no, it couldn't be further from the truth. I refuse to allow my body to get hooked on that junk. So I will go for months without taking any medications just to prove a point to myself that I can go cold turkey and you're not going to get the best of me. Um, I'm a Latino, I, you know, you ain't gonna get the best of me. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to put a warning out there. If you're obese and you're trying to lose weight and you think the easy way out is bariatric surgery, look, try the gastric sleeve, try the lap band, but by God, do not get the gastric bypass. I cannot stress enough that the warning that should be out there for this surgery, the amount of people that pass, the amount of people who have lifelong complications like myself, who now, I can't, I love Mexican food, now I can't handle the textures, I can't handle the smell. It's like I'm pregnant 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This, my sense of smell is gone bonkers. My sense of taste has changed. So things that I used to love to eat, now I can't even handle the smell. Uh, we went out for lunch yesterday. I got a side of, um, what do you call it, um, sautéed uh, corn. I spent $41 on this salad and this burger for my husband and a meal for my son. Uh, Oporto ripoff. It's bland and dry and ugh, the rice is just, does Mexican food no justice or Portuguese food no justice. I mean... It's the Australianised version. In Australia, they don't cook with salt to taste. And to me, that is just like boohoo. You know, in Colombia, everything is salt to taste. So you've got that yummy flavour here. They cook potatoes with no salt. And it's just like, whoa. They cook um, peas with no salt. I remember the very first time in my adopted home we had peas. And I was like, ooh, yum. Took a big mouthful. Ooh. Rice with no salt, peas with no salt. I was like, what is that? So my parents refused to let us lift the table until all the food was gone. So I used to get a water and I'd swallow it whole. I'd just have mouthfuls, swallow it whole. 
so that I wouldn't get in trouble. My sister was smart. She learnt to sit near the plants and she would get handfuls and bury it in the plants. It wasn't for years that my parents found napkins and bundles of food in the, <laughs> in the plants. <laughs> she was smart. She, 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 she got away with it too. I wasn't, I ha, I'm not a very good liar. I tried lying to my mum once about uh, saying that I'm going with my girlfriends to the movies and um, really I was going with a boyfriend, with my uh, tennis boyfriend. We'd been doing tennis for years together and, um, you know, I was really nervous. I was in grade eight and... Um, yeah, we, um, he told his mum that we were going on a date and I was too afraid to tell my parents, so I told them we are going on a group movie thing. And an hour later, I went to my mum bawling my eyes out just before I was, I was supposed to go to the movies, saying, I'm um, so sorry, mum, I lied to you. I was actually going to the movies with my boyfriend and um, there was a group of people going, but we were going to go on a date. And she said, yes, I know, you're the worst liar. <laughs> she goes, I've known the whole time. I was just wondering how long it was going to take you to break. And she goes, I didn't take you long. She goes, within five minutes, I could tell you the guilt on your face was just taking hold of you. And um, I was allowed to go, got got a kiss. I was, you know, your stomach butterflies and all that stuff. And um, it was funny. But um, <laughs> I suck at lying. It's, um, <laughs> so I don't even bother. I tell it like it is. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, well, dump it. You know, you either like me or you hate me or like me or hate me. It's still an impression. Like, oh, what's the song? Still an obsession. If you like me, then thank you. If you hate me, then F you. You know what I mean? It's a good song. I can't remember the artist. She's, um, British. And, um, I've got her album, but anyways, long story. Anyway, going back, I wanted to start my story by telling you a little bit of my background. So, um, I know a lot of you will come and say, well, why, why don't you do a book? Now, I prefer to do this by video because this way my kids can go back and look at it. And um, before any of you come to me, come for me about my kids being on videos, look, I don't tell them to come on videos. They nag and nag and nag because they want to dance for you guys. They don't have, <laughs> they don't have the Latin rhythm whatsoever. I love you guys, but you suck at dancing. <laughs> you don't have a salsa move in your bones, but I um, wish I could teach you. It's um, something that saddens me that I'm not able to do unless I drink and, you know, but then they're asleep, I think, because I wouldn't drink with my kids up. Um, so anyway, my story begins... In Colombia. So I was born in Sevilla on the 12th of May 1981. I uh, was one of many siblings and um, by the age of seven my biological siblings have all been abandoned at different stages and sent to family members and all this stuff. Then our mother got pregnant to her, car her boyfriend at the time. She got given a choice to either keep us or keep him. Now, this is where it gets kind of sad because she chose him over her two, three youngest kids and um, she left. We were in an abandoned house and the toilet was a hole on the, on the floor. Um, I remember finding condoms in the backyard this backyard, there was chocos growing wild and beans. So for a long time, because um, I was on the street kid, we used to beg for food, we lived on uh, chocos and beans. To this day, I cannot stand the look, the, to even look at a choco. Like when they came to Australia, I was like, oh, hell no. You know, a lot of Indians took hold of it and they're like, oh, make Indian, you know, choco chutneys and choco this. I'm like... Will not touch one. I cut my knee, you, you know, doing one, took a big chunk out of my knee. Um, anyway, so it got abandoned. I don't know how, but I tracked my biological mother down. She pretty much closed the door in our face and said, go away, I don't want you. 
then I spent the next 12 months looking at after my brother and my sister as oh, about seven year old, looking after a four year old and a five year old um, by myself, thinking I was a grown up. I fed them, I cleaned them. You know, I, I did the best I could for that age. And after a year, somebody noticed in the neighborhood that there was this young girl looking after two younger kids by herself notified the government, notified the authorities. They came and got us, um, separated us, which was a big heartbreak for me because I'd never been apart from my brother and my sister. I was their mum. Spent a year in foster care and had a tamal, a empanada for the first time in my life there. To this day, I can remember the taste, the juiciness, the tenderness, the crunchiness, the pork. I've asked Mama Appetite big Mama Appetite, if you could please make one because that is a recipe that I would cherish. I would love to have a pork empanada. Um, I know I could, probably won't be able to eat it, but just to be able to smell the corn, I don't know, it's just, it's a memory that means so much to me. Um, so we spent a year in foster care, then we went to an orphanage in Cali. We spent two years in Cali. There was about 15 families interested in us, uh, 14 of whom backed out because I was 11 years at the time, just turned 11 years old, and um, they didn't want an 11-year-old preteen, you know, who pretty much I saw myself as a mother. The kids were mine, and they're all I knew. So I was a mother hen at the orphanage. I was a mother hen for my sister and my brother I was in bossy boots um you know then we got adopted by a very generous couple in Australia who unfortunately weren't prepared weren't not that they weren't mentally prepared but they weren't um well no they weren't mentally prepared for what was to come you know like I tricked the orphanage into thinking that I hadn't been raped by really like I did these exercises I'd heard of I don't know why but I was really young I was pretty smart for survival instinct I knew that if they'd realized that I'd been raped that I would be separated from my brother and my sister and I'd be sent to a nunnery until I was 18 and then I'd be on my own now I was smart enough that I would like tighten myself up so much that they couldn't um properly investigate therefore they said oh no she's a virgin she's never been touched there's no way she's too tight so I was able to be adopted so I got adopted into Australia it wasn't until the I was savagely raped at the age of five and I was watched my dad get murdered at the age of I believe it was four or five it wasn't far apart between those two but I remember being tied to a bed gagged blindfolded and it was like this single bed and it was very hard and it was very cold and I don't remember having a mattress it was um because we didn't have furniture like that we had a bed that the mattress was straw and it had a big hole in the middle from all the kids peeing on it and um yeah anyway that was my start of life was begging on the streets for food. The way I fed my brother and my sister was by begging for food and people would throw meatballs or things like that on the floor and I would take it and feed my brother and my sister and if there was anything left, I would eat. So when we got to the orphanage, um, we started getting regular meals and I started to hoard food because you, I wouldn't, I didn't, mentality was like, I don't know if I'm going to get fed again. So you have that fear. You'd go and you'd steal so I would go on my way to church, I would climb trees and steal green mangoes from trees and um, guavas and stuff like that and then take them back to the orphanage and hide them and, and eat them. And um, yeah, there's been part of my life is hoarding food. Um, I'm getting a lot better at it. I'm get, doing a lot of counseling for trauma. I've seen numerous people get murdered in Colombia. I've been a victim of child abuse, sexual abuse, mental abuse, you name it. Been there, done that. Lived through it, here to tell the tale. Um, you know, then came to Australia, 
when I was between the 40, age of 14 to 15, I was raped again by my English tutor, English and math tutor. He was an elderly gentleman um, who was a black belt at martial arts. I remember one day I told him, oh, you know, I, uh, I've got my period, um, my menstruation. And he said, no, you don't. Um, knocked me down. I was on my back. He had his foot on my chest and said, don't you ever effing lie to me again. Then pointed to the fridge. He had a calendar there and had my period marked when it was due when I got my period. Um, yeah, we were supposed to go to court and got delayed, got delayed, got postponed. Eventually he ended up passing away from a heart attack. To this day, I don't feel like I got justice. I got dirty money because the government gave me a victim's compensation, but I spent it really quick because to me it was dirty money. I didn't want that crap. Um, you know, it's um, something that still I feel guilty to this day because I feel like I should have known better. I'd gone through it before. I'd, I opened up to him. And he'd used lollies and money and all this stuff to bribe me. And I just felt stupid because I fell for it. And it wasn't until my sister was walking funny one day that I went to school, boarding school, and I absolutely lost it. I went to watch her play a basketball game and I could see, I just knew he'd been touching her. And a deal I had with him was, you do whatever you want to me, but you never touch my sister. Never. He swore he'd never touch my sister, and he did. So I was acting out at school. I was getting punching a lot of girls because I went to an all-girls school, getting into fights, and just losing my shit, basically. And I finally opened up to my, Engl my drama and English teacher and just told her what had been happening. Um, the next day I woke up. I got called up to the principal's office. I was extremely scared. Got there, there was my mum, my adopted mum, my and my dad, my mum and dad. There was two police women. One was in uniform, one was not. There was the principal and there was my English teacher. Nobody said anything except the police woman said, you need to come with us. I got put into a, a car, a unmarked police car, and got driven to a police station. My parents didn't say a word. The lady said, you need to come and make a statement. As you can imagine, being 14, 15, I was terrified, didn't know what I'd done wrong. I was so angry with the teacher because she swore she'd never tell anybody. And being someone who doesn't trust very easily, to me, that was such a huge betrayal that she, by the next morning, I was like, oh, I did something wrong. I was the bad guy. Um, now, in the police station, they asked me, was he circumcised? And I, I said, I don't know what that means, but I can draw it. And I, I'm very, I was very good at drawing. I think I still am. Um, I drew his penis. I drew the belt he'd wear around his hips. I was able to draw where he kept his pornography. Um, instruct them where to find everything hidden and everything like that. They went and did a raid. They found everything where I said it was going to be. And it was only after that. And I still don't think to this day my parents believe me. Uh, they got told me she's telling the truth. And um. My family's way of dealing with it was, we don't talk about it, it never happened, move forward. For me, that was really hard because that happened to me about my adoption, you know. You 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 got brought to Australia, you should be grateful you're not in Colombia, blah, 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 blah. Not allowing me the, they didn't know. They did the best they could, but they didn't know that I was acting out because I was mourning the... I was 11 years old. I had a lot of memories of Colombia. Not a lot of good ones, but I had memories. I have a memory of my biological father, one memory, which I've shared on the video before this. And um, 
yeah, it, um, I got sent to psychiatrist, psychologist, I got diagnosed with every mental health illness under the sun, you know, I was this, I was that, I was something else, it took 38 years to get diagnosed properly, I've got borderline personality, I don't argue with that, yes I do, I have severe PTSD trauma, still to this day, it's, it's a, an ongoing thing, um, and that's pretty much it. That's what I've been diagnosed in, in depression um, due because of the severe PTSD and my spinal, my medical problems makes it, I don't know if you can imagine being in pain 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And when people say, what's your pain score out of 10? And you can honestly look at them in the eye and say, you can stub me in my spine right now and I would prefer that than what I feel every day because it's a constant goosebumps wanting to throw up wanting to, like the feeling of you're going to pass out any minute it's unless you have this chronic pain it's unbelievably hard to explain to you guys how draining emotionally physically and mentally it is it's just consumes you 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 want to like I keep having this idealistic views that I want to go and have a picnic with my family my husband really husband generally goes no we can't do that because you're going to pass out and I say to him don't count me out I'm Latino do not count me out before you've given me a fair go you know let's take a blanket I'll lay down you go cook I'll watch you guys eat <laughs> I'll drink my water I'll um you know, have my white of a hard boiled egg because I can't eat the yolk for some reason. The texture makes me sick. Um, you know, I used to love tuna. Can't eat tuna. It's a, it's a new process. You know, going from chronic pain to passing out from chronic pain to passing out because your body is doesn't have enough fluids, doesn't have enough food. Going from up and down dieting to now I'm um, malnutrition and I'm, um, you know, I went and bought a size Australian 12, which would be about an Australian American size 8 or 6, I believe. Um, I think now I'm a size 0 American. It's crazy to believe. But I still look in the mirror and I see the bigger girl. And it's only recently, or about two days ago, that my husband took photos of our family. And I'm sitting there and I'm tiny. And I said to him, holy shit, I'm tiny. Like, you can see the bones in, if I lift my arms, like, my rib bones are showing. I got the smallest bras I could find for me. And I'm a big busted girl, even as a size six or zero whatever it is I'm still a d cup but I severely need a breast lift because my breasts just go look um and it's quite embarrassing for me I don't like looking at myself in the mirror I've got skin sagging in my stomach it's I've got I look like I've hollow these holes on my side because the skin's pulling and, um, you know, I've, I've just lost so much weight so quick that my body hasn't had the time to elasticize and I'm putting oils and all that stuff. But I've been told the only way I'm going to be able to get that fixed is to get a breast lift and to get a tummy tuck and skin removal and blah, blah, blah. But after spending the amount of money on my surgery that went bonkers, I can't afford it I've got enough money left over to put a deposit for a house and to me that's my priority right now I was given 15 years to leave last year I very blessed that my bariatric uh, doctor that was looking after me before he um, sent me to Dr Hopkins he uh, shout out to Dr Brendan Henrahan you saved my life Without you, I would be dead. Um, you're an amazing man. And um, he 
came from Seoul and had just been at a conference that we're talking about heterotopic esophagation. Now, maybe one in three doctors knows about it, but not many doctors know how to treat it. They don't know, a lot of doctors don't know anything about it. They've never even heard of it. It's that rare that by researching it, I seem to be the only person to have it on my spine. I cannot find an article, medical article in the medical journals or anything like that that a paper's been done on heterotopic suffocation of the spine. There's uh, articles on the knees, on the hips, on the um, elbows, none that relate to the spine. So I've got a bone that's about that big. I don't know how to, I don't know, maybe six inches. And it, it's like an extra tailbone on the outside and it's point it was small on the bottom but bigger at the top and it um when i move it pushes up onto my spinal fusion the um pin and the screws and stuff like that and it goes <coughs> it's like if i could post it guys i would if i could if i knew how to add sound if i knew how to do all this stuff i could you know, you you know exactly what I'm talking about. The noise, it is, ugh. And the, the pain that goes with it. If you can imagine somebody shoving a knife in your bottom bone and pushing it up, it'd be like that. But the suddenness of it makes you just go boom, pass out from pain. It's excruciating. Walking is a nightmare. I can do only so little and for the last two and a half weeks I've been able to sit three times. Uh, drove two times which was huge to me that a bit of freedom that elation it was awesome. So from the age of 15 I had a few back problems so scoliosis and stuff like that. On the 28th of December 2005 I had a partner at the time who was addicted to smoking marijuana and I'd just been paid. He'd already been paid and spent it all. And so I'd just been paid. And he wanted $50 to go and buy and get on. And this time I just refused. It's the second time I'd ever said no. And it's the second time he hit me. He did. He was a um, kickboxer. There's a... What's the name of it? MMA fighter type stuff. He 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 was a fighter like my husband now. He he's a trained martial artist. He was a trained fighter, and he did a roundhouse kick, and bang! I went down the two sets of stairs backwards. My I cracked my skull open. I've got a dent indentation in my skull, and I begged him to call the ambulance. He wouldn't. He packed up my trailer packed up his stuff and he took off running out of the state. I I walked to the hospital. I had towels, monks, towels, monk towels covered and dripping in blood all over me from my head injury. And um, then about six weeks after the incident, um, my, my dad flew over with my brother. I was skin and bones. They flew me back. I left everything I had at that property so they could rent it out fully equipped. I said, just keep it, keep the the security deposit. You know, this is what's happened. I got to go. Um, so I pretty much had to start from scratch. Uh, thank you, my dad, for coming to rescue me. That was the last day of that relationship and I never went back to him ever and um but because of it i'd already been having a sciatic problems but after that i had six bulging discs and uh, um uh, bulging discs and a herniated disc and all this stuff and i managed to go back to work and then i got injured again couldn't work then managed to get myself physio and meds and 
managed to go back to work. I worked up until uh, this, uh, no, 5th of November 2011 when I fell off a ladder in August um, and I landed on my heels and the pain that shot up my spine, the crunch was unbelievable. I Within 6 to 12 months I had to get a uh, surgery. It didn't go as planned. Um, so I got re-injured that December. It was done on the April, 26th of April, 2012. In December of that year, a young kid next door to my sister, a neighbor, he wanted to show off that he could lift a big girl and um, bear hugged me from behind, squeezed me and lifted me up and my spine was done. It was gone. So I spent time in hospital. Um, but it wasn't up until... It was getting worse and worse and worse. But it wasn't up until another kid knocked me at a play centre that all my nerves just bunched up. And I was incontinent. Couldn't use my legs. Paralysed from the waist down. Couldn't do anything. And got a scan and the my private physician said you need emergency surgery sent me to a hospital they said oh no you know you can put up with it for a bit longer exactly a week later i went to another hospital because i already knew that this hospital weren't interested went to another hospital and said like i need help i can't feel my legs i can't control my bowels i can't feel anything and i spent a week there Still nothing had happened. Then I ended up ringing Green Slopes Private Hospital and saying, look, I'm at this hospital next to you. Um, they're not doing anything. I'm not hearing anything. I need help. This is the results of my scan. This is what my doctor sent. He rang the head surgeon straight away. But that afternoon, the head surgeon of the hospital was in the public hospital, came down and he said, I'm really sorry. You're booked in for emergency surgery on the 21st of December 2018, 2017. So I got that procedure done. Unbeknownst to anybody, no one was expecting it to go wrong. It could have been the fact that the doctor who did it was the one who said he wasn't going to do it. And he got made to do it. I went down to the theatre. He refused to make eye contact with me. And I thought, oh, this is not going to be good. I had the surgery. Never saw him again. Um, the team came up, said, you know, went well. I was able to sit. I was able to stand. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, it's worked. Yay. A week later, noticed that there was grinding happening. And this pain, this pain that I hadn't had before was happening. Went to see my other private physician to say, look, I don't know what's going on. He heard me walking in and he just went, oh, hell no. There's something drastically wrong. They've screwed up your surgery. Get back to hospital right now. He called an ambulance. Took 45 minutes to come, literally next door. Went to the hospital. They did a scan. This was three months after my surgery of being in living hell. Um, they did a scan. It came up that I had heterotopical suffocation. Basically, this team came up, said, you've got this. This is what it looks like. It's going to keep growing. It's untreatable it's blah 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 it's eventually going to be terminal uh, see you later that was it that's the last time i heard from the doctors there they i got told i was going to be referred to the royal brisbane hospital women's hospital um found out this year that i hadn't even been referred i haven't been transferred and nothing was done so i'm on a waiting list to see a neurosurgeon there um but luckily for me dr brendan henrahan he put me on this diabetic medication that was very expensive, but for the three months that I was on it, it stopped the bone growing. It was growing at three times the speed of normal bone growth. And if it wasn't for him, it would still would have kept growing and I would be more paralyzed, more limited, more incapacitated than I am now. But thank, thanks to him catching this, and putting me on this medication, which unfortunately after three months got taken off the shelf, it was discontinued, it was, there was nothing else. But 
I was on it long enough that it reduced the bone growth and it stopped any further growth. So, um, very blessed. You know, I thank this man from the bottom of my heart and Dr. Um, Dr. Grice. The, you two doctors have been Dr. Timothy Grice. You found out what was wrong when nobody else believed me. You got me to get the surgery. You got me taken seriously. Dr. Henrahan, you're my saviour. Without you, I would literally be dead many times over because nobody cared. My GP didn't care. All he saw was I was getting losing weight and yay, you know. It took me a long time to change doctors. This year, I finally had enough of referrals that said, thank you for seeing Mrs. Blanca Wagodan. She's got severe back problems. No description, no diagnosis, no medicate. Like, really? No wonder I kept getting knocked back from all my referrals. When and I'm now seeing a Dr. Walid Eldersoki, he's absolutely amazing. I went from a total terrible doctor who didn't give a rat's ass, didn't listen, to a doctor who is communicating with the hospital, is communicating with my specialists. Everything's, everyone's on board. <sighs> Tell you what, it's tears of joy that I finally, thank you Lord for finding this man for me because he loves my kids. My kids go in, they act absolutely crazy. He gives them a lollipop. Thank you for giving them much bigger sugar rush. But um, they love him. They trust him. They let him put needles in them, which is pretty big considering my kids are, yeah. Um, they've seen me get needles many times, but when it comes to them, they're like, hell no. Um, you know, I finally have a good team that are taking care of me. They understand that I'm a complicated case. If there's a rare condition that someone's going to get for some weird reason, my ass gets it. <laughs> If there's a complication that one in a billion can, can happen to, my body goes, yep, I'll be that person. Let me have a go. <laughs> you know, um, and there's two ways you can do You can look at it, guys. It's either you can roll with it, learn from it, learn to deal with it, or you can cry and go doom and gloom and be depressed. I've been both. I've been suicidal. I've attempted many times and nearly passed no more than a month and a half ago from taking a large dose of tramadol liquid and uh, morphine sulfate liquid that I have. I felt so selfish and so horrible. They had to keep stimulating my heart all night. They had to keep me awake. They had to keep doing all this stuff because my heart kept wanting to stop and um, I remember them laughing and I wasn't sure whether I was hallucinating or what but I remember them laughing saying what an idiot you know why would you even bother blah 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 and this is at the hospital you know the hospital I hate the most they're there laughing at, at you know someone who's like on the verge um, you know one minute I was so relaxed and I was so calm because I was accepting my faith my my you know, what was meant to be would be. And the next minute I'd hear people laughing at me and commenting about how it was stupid, you know, someone with two kids, how could be so selfish? And I think it was at that time that I realised just how much I wanted to leave. And it's the one time that I've just actually just turned around and gone, screw the negativity. You know, no matter how much I get put down by my husband sometimes, no matter how much he tries to, I'm not going to allow that to happen anymore. I'm going to stand up for myself. I'm not going to allow myself to get over angry and all that sort of stuff I want to try and become. I'm doing this course that's helping me deal with my emotions. I'm reading books, dealing with my adoption feelings of wanting to go visit my family but being unable to because of stipulations being put forth by my adopted mother. I, I know she doesn't mean any nastiness by it, but it's causing a lot of turmoil within me because it's got nothing to do with her. She can never be replaced. To me, she's my mummy. 
Like, when I have a bad day, I want to call my mum. I can't, because I signed a contract that I wouldn't give him any drama or cause him any heartache. So I can't, literally can't go to my parents when I'm having a bad day or I'm crying and I need my mum. I can't just ring her and just go, you know, I miss you. I want someone that I have to deal with that. That rejection, I guess, that feeling. I don't hold any ill feelings towards my parents. Look, they've done the best they knew the how. They've coped with it the best they know how. They're humans that made mistakes. I just wish I would be given the opportunity to go see my biological family to I know I don't belong there, I know I don't belong here, I'm trapped in this triangle where I'm Colombian born, but I don't speak the language, I'm Australian, but I'm not quite, I don't quite fit in. I look in the mirror, I see a Latino, I look within myself and I'm white. <laughs> it's the strangest thing, it's like, to me, I'm an Aussie, but to others... I still have an accent. I, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's this isolating feeling, you know, the only one true unconditional love I've ever felt is from my son and my daughter. And in the last month, my sister's contacted me. I haven't spoken to her since 2013. I was pregnant at the time. We went through this family thing and, um, She's doing a nursing degree, which I cannot tell you how proud I am. Out of all three of us, she's following her dreams. I would love to finish my degrees, but it's not something I can ever do. It's I don't have the physical capabilities, and now I can't even write. To, so it's just, it's me impossible now for me. You know, all I can do is try and do videos like this and see if I can get a following and hopefully get an income because I don't want to be on welfare for the rest of my life. I want to hopefully buy a house and set my kids up and give them an example that, you know, I started a business, uh, cost me $11,000 for everything to get it set up. And I had to close it this year because after my surgery last year, I was too ill to do anything, you know, I was, couldn't do orders and uh, couldn't put them together, everything like that. So I shut it down at a loss of 11 grand, didn't make any money. Um, so, you know, that sucked. So my next goal is to hopefully get my story out there in bits and pieces and hope that I can help someone out there with their journey, whether it's adoption, those feelings of isolation, those feelings of you know, looking in the mirror and not seeing how you feel. Um, the feelings of, like, you feel like you're nuts. You feel like you're crazy. I remember telling my adopted parents, no, I've got more than one sister. There's like, no, 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 you only have one sibling and her name's Gloria. There's only four of you. And I said, no, 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 no. There's lots of us. There's lots of us. They said, no, there's not. And... um There is. <laughs> I was right. I'm not crazy. And the memories I have of finding a decapitated head and watching someone who I thought was my sister get murdered. She was one year older than me. And all this stuff with this toilet block and all these memories I have, I actually Google mapped them and found the places. So that all these times that I was made to feel like I was nuts, that it was all in my head. I can actually show on a map and say, this is where this happened. This is where I found that. This is where this happened. This is where I got dumped and thrown into the ocean, into the river that was full of garbage because I wasn't wanted. I was put in a potato sack and my mother literally threw me away. Um, you know, all those memories that I have are real. They really did happen. I'm not nuts. And um, that, just that validation alone, looking at those things and finding them, takes a big weight off your shoulders because everyone's like, 
you don't know what you're talking about, blah, blah, blah. You were too young to understand. You don't know what you're talking about. Um, but they did happen. And, you know, the things were uh, that happened are there. And it's, um, yeah, I've been in contact with my biological mom. Uh, I prefer to keep in touch with my biological sister, the one who I thought was murdered in front of me, who, thanks, mum. Uh, East Lenny, sorry, you know my mum. You know, she told me that because of me she'd been murdered and all this stuff for till 2013, I, I had this guilt that I got my older sister murdered. All because she chose to go to this toilet block with this guy who was flashing his penis and calling us over and I refused to go. She went. He killed her with the um, ceramic toilet lid, hit her over the head till her skull was open. I'm sorry if this is really graphic. Um, went home crying. My mum bit the absolutely, bit me till I bled and said, it's your fault. It was my fault that my dad was murdered. It was my fault. A lot of things. To her, I was the devil's child, which is amazing because talking to her now, she goes, no, 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 you were my favourite. You... You know, I never hated you. And it's like, that is not the memories I have. I remember her, like, screaming at me, beating me with wooden planks, like, making me bleed. I had scars. I remember coming to Australia and all these kids would go, "What? why, why do you have all those marks on your back? And it was scars from my mother beating me. And um, And I know why she hated me, because she hated herself. I didn't realise that until I was an adult and looked at a picture of her and then saw myself and went, holy crap, I'm a split image of her. And so to her, I was the devil's child because she was seeing herself in me, even though I was a different person, different personality, and she had she has to be bipolar. Um, thank goodness that didn't go to me. Um, she would attack me and... You know, like my older sister Gloria would defend me and I will forever remember and cherish her for that. That she used to get between her mum and I, or, sorry, it's Lenny and myself, and defend me. And then she got sent away and I had no one, no protector. So, um, you know, for a long time I felt alone. I'm married, I am, but I don't have that trust that normal people should have in their spouse. I don't have that comfort and I love him to death. Do I feel like he loves me? No. Do I feel like I'm going to be abandoned again? Yes. It's, um, it's a, like, I'm like a rotisserie chicken. I'm just going round and round in circles. But I'm doing steps to stop the rotisserie style because I don't want to self-sabotage. I love my husband. And he wouldn't be here if he didn't love me. We've gone through some hellish times. Yes, we have. But we're still together. And as much as it hurts me that he doesn't want to have any more biological kids, I would still love two more babies. But realistically, I'm infertile now. And even if I fell pregnant by IVF, I would probably die. So... I'd need a surrogate, and surrogate's too expensive, so that's out of the question. So I've got to just be thank you to the Lord that I have two beautiful kids. And um, for now, I think I'm going to end it because my husband's just come home with dinner and I'm going to try my best to have some pork rib. Um, hopefully, wish me luck. Hope I can manage at least one rib. And um, I'll speak to you guys soon. Love yous. Bye.